Good afternoon. My name is Sarah Grant, representing the City and County of Broomfield, and I am the chair of the Dr. Cog Transportation Advisory Committee. I call to order the January 22nd, 2024 Dr. Cog meeting at 1.30. For this in-person slash live stream meeting format, members of the public attending by Zoom have the ability to mute and unmute themselves and share their webcam. Those attending online, please make sure you've typed your name and it reflects your first and last name and your representation. We ask that those intending to speak use the raise hand button to ask a question or comment on an agenda item. If you have any technical questions, you can direct those to staff in the chat box. Again, please use the raise hand feature for any questions or comments on an agenda item. Um, for members and alternates here in person, please press the unmute button on the bottom of your mic and be sure the light on your microphone is on and you're prepared to speak. Please speak clearly into the microphone so your voice will amplify and please announce your name and representation when asking a question or making a comment for the record. During the business agenda, TAC members and alternates can speak or ask questions. Members of the public may speak during public comments. Dr. Cog is sitting around the sign-in sheet. Uh, please do sign in. And at this time, members and alternates in person will introduce themselves. Um, please introduce your name and your representation. And uh, we'll mix it up a little bit and we'll start with Mr. Pilgrim. Okay. Uh, Rick Pilgrim, I'm in the environmental special interest. Justin Begley, City County of Denver. And Jennifer Hillhouse, City and County of Denver. Lauren Kurgis, Dr. Cog staff. Jim Mewson, uh, Region 4, uh, CDOT. Tom Moore, Regional Air Quality Council. Jeff Dinkenbring, Arapahoe County, City of Centennial. Bill Soroy, RTD. Chris Agahan, CDOT Division of Transportation Development. Jessica Mickledust, CDOT, Region 1. Frank Bruno, uh, VM Mobility Services. John Papsdorf, Dr. Cog. Jacob Rieger, Dr. Cog. Sarah Grant, City and County of Broomfield. Cam Kennedy, Dr. Cog, Staff. Ian Sanson, City of Boulder. Art Griffith with Douglas County. Hey, good afternoon, I'm Sean Poe uh, for Adams County. Uh, with the City of Commerce City. Jeff Boyd, Housing Special Interest. Matt Callison, Arapahoe County, City of Aurora. Kent Mormon, Adams County, City of Thornton. Chris Hudson, Douglas County, County of Parker. Lakeside Red, Boulder County. Christina Lane, Jefferson County. Mike Whitaker, Jefferson County, Lakewood. Brent Soderland, uh, Arapahoe County and City of Littleton. Kevin Ash, Weld County, Town of Frederick. Carson Priest, TDM, non-motorized. Great, thank you. Um, and just make sure that the light on your microphone lights up and you'll know that your voice is amplifying. Um, next, uh, this time I'll hand it over to Mr. Rieger to um, announce some uh, changes to the TAC. First meeting of the year. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. We do have one membership change this month. Um, Michelle Melanakis from the City of Lafayette, who was an alternate, um, is now the new member for the Boulder County contingent. Phil Greenwald, who has been a member for a very long period of time, um, has become an alternate. So um, the Boulder County Forum approved that just last Friday. So officially welcome to uh, Michelle and not goodbye to Phil, as I say it. Wonderful, thank you, Mr. Rieger. And now we'll move on to public comment. Um, public comment is limited to three minutes. And if you've joined by Zoom, please raise your hand by pressing the raise hand button and we'll call on you to begin speaking. If you've joined by phone, please raise your virtual hand by pressing star nine and we'll call on you by the last three digits of your phone number. Staff will unmute you and you'll need to unmute yourself by pressing star six on your phone. You'll have three minutes to speak after which we will ask you to wrap up and your line will be muted. 
And as a reminder after public comment, only TAC members and alternates will partake in the discussion regarding the agenda item. Do we have any public comment? Um, first of all, see if anybody is here in person for public comment. And do we have any public comment online? Please raise your hand, or if you're on the phone, you can raise your virtual hand by pressing star nine. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. I'll give it a second, but do not see any hands raised at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. Um, seeing as we have no public comment here in person or online, we will move on to the next item, which is a review of the meeting summary from the December 4th, 2023 um, Transportation Advisory Committee meeting. Um, is there any discussion, corrections, or questions um, regarding the TAC summary? Seeing none from the membership, um, the minutes will stand approved and we will move on to the first um, agenda item for action. And this is agenda item number four in your packet, the Transportation Improvement Program Policy Amendments. This is attachment B in your packet. And I'll hand it over to Josh Schwenk, Senior Transportation Planner. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I do have two uh, proposed amendments to the Transportation Improvement Program. These are both related to the same action. Um, so the first, uh, currently there is $10 million in the Safer Main Streets pool dedicated to Lakewood's West Colfax Safety Project. Uh, the first would be to take that funding out of this pool. And the second action would be to apply that funding <clears throat> excuse me, to the standalone project, which uh, is a currently existing project in the TIP. Uh, this just uh, simplifies how this funding is shown in the TIP, um, and that funding is split between uh, state legislative and legislative transit funds. I'm happy to take any questions uh, that committee members may have. Otherwise, I do have a recommendation for you available. Thank you, Mr. Schwenk. Are there any um, questions or comments? I see Mr. Mormon, you have your hands raised. So this isn't changing the, the, the cost, it's just moving funds around? Correct. So the funds are currently programmed to this project uh, within the Safer Main Streets pool. It's just taking those pool funds, moving them to the separate standalone project. Uh, the total funding for the project remains the same. Thank you. Any additional questions or comments? And uh, we, there is a recommendation for a motion. Mr. Whitaker. I'll move to recommend to the RTC the attached program amendments for the fiscal 24-27 tip. Thank you, Mr. Whitaker, and I believe that's a second by Mr. Griffith. Thank you, we have a motion and a second. Um, all, uh, is there any discussion? Seeing none, uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Extensions? Passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we will move on to uh, action item and uh, is number five in your packet, 2024 Federal Safety Performance Measure Targets. This is attachment C in your packet. And I'll hand it over to Ms. Lauren Kurgis, um, Assistant Planner, who has also been recently promoted to Multimodal Transportation Planner. Congratulations. Yeah, Madam Chair, while well, Lauren's getting set up, thank you for noting that. I did want to acknowledge that both Lauren and her colleague, Brittany Compton, um, are um, promoted to our plan multimodal transportation planners in our sub-area and project planning team um, under Nora Kern, who you're going to hear from in the next agenda item. Um, these are both internal promotions within Dr. Cog, so we're really pleased uh, to have them on our team, and congratulations to both of them. And no pressure, Lauren. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Lauren Kurgis. I'm a planner here at Dr. Cog. Today I'm going to be discussing the safety performance measures and targets. So uh, 
we have our federal performance areas. We have several of them um, that are reviewed. We do a check-in every two years, um, and we set targets every four years. For the performance measure one, which is safety performance, we do that annually. So that is the only one we're going to be reviewing today. So I'm just going to give a quick overview of the performance measure. Um, we'll go through some data, some rationale, um, and talk about some of the work that we're doing here at Dr. Cog and next steps moving forward. So just a really brief overview. Um, the area that's covered for this performance measure is all public roads. Um, and the data that we use to evaluate and set targets is provided by CDOT. Um, for this performance measure, we do have five separate measures that we look at, and that includes the number of fatalities, the rate of fatalities per 100 million vehicle miles traveled, the number of serious injuries, the rate of serious injuries per 100 million vehicle miles traveled, and the number of non-motorized fatalities and serious injuries. In the calculations for these, we use a five-year rolling average. The federal guidance does tell us that the targets that we set should be realistic and achievable and not aspirational. And lastly, there is no financial penalty for this, but um, if we're not meeting those targets, we can expect some additional scrutiny um, in the planning process um, during the next four-year review with our federal partners. So just kind of looking back at um, where we stand in previous years um, uh, and currently as well. Um, so for all five performance measures, you can see, of course, our desired trend is that it be downward. Um, and there's been some variation in what we've achieved um, for some of these since 2018, um, 2018 to 2022. Um, and you can see that we have our little hourglass for 2022 and that is because we're still waiting on data from CDOT for that year. Um, however, we did do an estimate of fatalities um, using the uh, fatalities by county data from CDOT. And so that preliminary estimate that we have is 346 fatalities. So I'm going to briefly touch on some of the actions we're taking towards achieve, achieving safety targets. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them, but they are in your packets. Um, so firstly, we're working on improving collaboration between allied agencies. Um, our safety and regional Vision Zero planner here at Dr. Cog um, hosts a monthly regional Vision Zero work group, and so we're going to be continuing to do that this year. We're also working on increasing awareness and adoption of Vision Zero. Um, that includes a strategic update to our plan, taking action on regional Vision Zero. Um, and we've been working on that in 2023 and currently. Um, it is uh, going to be open to public comment very shortly, so you will be hearing more about that in the next couple of months. Um, we've also been participating in a two-year Vision Zero community peer exchange. Um, so our peer partner in that is Metro, which is Portland's MPO. And in 2023, a couple of our staff went to Portland for a visit, and likewise, they came here to Denver um, to visit us and see the work that we're doing um, on Vision Zero. We're also working on designing and retrofitting roadways to prioritize safety. Um, so we've developed a regional complete streets toolkit that addresses safety related aspects of street design, um, incorporates vision zero principles, crash profiles and countermeasures. We also conducted a regional complete streets prioritization analysis um, for the region to identify those top corridors for investing funds. And we're uh, increasing funding and resources. So our most recently approved TIP, the 24 to 27 TIP, includes 207 projects at almost 435 million that will improve safety. And lastly, we're working on improving data collection and reporting. Um, we have a, a senior crash data consortium planner here at Dr. Cog that's leading this effort. Um, and we also, in 2023, developed a regional Vision Zero story map 
um, which is a nice uh, sort of more visual tool for our local governments to have access um, to look at uh, area type crash profiles and countermeasures. Okay, so getting into some of the data here, um, this is for achieving zero fatalities by 2040. Um, the green line is our observed data and the blue is our trend line for what we would need to reach zero fatalities by 2040. And you can see that that would require um, an average yearly reduction of 13 fatalities. Those orange, they kind of look like brown to you dots up there, um, those are what make up the data points for our calculation for the five-year rolling average. Uh, similarly, for achieving zero serious injuries by 2045, um, we have our observed data in green. Our trend line shows us that um, it would require a reduction of 68 serious injuries annually um, on average um, to reach that goal of zero, zero serious injuries by 2045. And for achieving zero non-motorized fatalities and serious injuries, um, that would require an average yearly reduction of three non-motorized fatalities um, and 12 non-motorized serious injuries. Um, and you can see that uh, these three, the, the plots, um, follow a similar trend as far as observed data. And so these are our proposed um, 2024 safety targets. Um, we're still uh, unable to calculate the baseline. Again, we're waiting on the 2022 data from CDOT, um, but on your screen and in your packets, you can see our 2024 targets. Um, so I'll just pause here for a moment. And lastly, I just wanted to talk about um, some next steps, things um, that are coming up in the next year that we're working on here at Dr. Cog. Um, the first I already mentioned, but we, we have an update to our, our safety plan, our taking action on Regional Vision Zero plan. Um, and um, that's wrapping up here shortly. We are exploring a regional um, Safe Streets and Roads for All grant um, and would like to reach out to our local um, member governments um, on that. This is uh, very early stages, but we are developing a crash data dashboard. And lastly, we also are working on a, an update to our active transportation plan this year. Um, so on screen, I have a proposed motion and I'm happy to take any questions or comments. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Curtis, for that presentation. Uh, do we have any questions or comments for Dr. Cogstaff? Jim McAllison. Thank you. Lauren, a question in the presentation, you broke out uh, uh, serious in fatalities, uh, but not in the non-motorized, for, for motorized. Uh, and just curious, I'm looking at your last uh, aggregate table. Uh, have serious fatalities, serious injuries, and then number of non-motorized fatalities and serious injuries combined. Yeah, um, and I might ask for Alvin's help as well. Um, we do have those numbers separately, but we we do combine them for the um, for reporting purposes. And my understanding is that's what the feds uh, ask for. Do you have separate targets for non-motorized serious and non-motorized fatality? It's it's one target here, um, but we we can see the difference in the data. We do have that distinction in the data. Yes, it'd be good for tracking and and trending. Yeah, we're definitely looking at that, but just for the purposes of establishing these targets, the feds ask that we have those two together. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Mr. Pilgrim. Um, Andrea. 
Yeah, so I saw that you had estimated potentially around 345, potentially for 2022, and yet the calculation uses about 305. Do you, do you, are you still comfortable with that lower number, even though the higher, it might be significantly higher for 2022? Yeah, um, it definitely is uh, a high estimate. Um, the... Um, so this number is calculated like based on the projection that we have to reach the target. Um, so we do use that as our projected number for 2022. Um, again, with the 300 and I think it was 46, um, that's sort of like a preliminary estimate that we calculated based on the county data that's not official from CDOT. Um, so we don't know yet what that would look like. So that's why the projection is 305. Um, but it is definitely something that, you know, we're, we're thinking about and looking at because that, you know, it's a little bit concerning um, how high that is. Yeah, and just to clarify that a little bit, the federal requirements under setting this measure are a little bit complicated in the sense that they require that we use a five-year rolling average, but we typically only know about three of those years. So we're having to estimate kind of the most recent year or two to calculate that average. So at the same time, we're talking about individual sort of years where we're doing estimates to kind of understand what the data might be or what the, what the number might be. But again, to set the target, we're using the five-year rolling average. So it it kind of skews things a little bit because you're looking at that point in time, that five-year point in time that can be influenced by the, the earliest year dropping off and trying to estimate for the latest years, if that makes sense. I probably didn't make that any less confusing. I think maybe Ms. Ms. Gobus might have something to add. Oh, no, I just have a question to make sure I can confuse it more for us. Um, so, the, so the only year, based on what you have on the screen, that we can actually make a difference going forward is 2024, even though we don't have the data for 22 and 23, right? Because our ability to decrease fatalities in those years has already passed. That is precisely correct. Okay. And, and that's so, the way that we have to do it. So what is the percent reduction we're looking at then, if I don't calculate it wrong, are we looking at a five year? If we were to say we minus 13 fatalities, is that the percentage would be calculated based off the average of these five years? I'm just looking for a percent because we're looking at our fatality and serious injury rate and we're looking at a minus 15 percent. So I'm wondering where we are kind of in percent space. Governor Alvin, do you happen to know that? Uh, no, at the moment we don't do a percentage calculation, but that could be something we look at uh, moving after this presentation for um, both RTC and the board and to report back out. Mr. Pilgrim. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Curtis, thanks. Uh, I have to admit that I started paying attention to this maybe 2018, and I've been alarmed every year at, um, at the increase in automobile fatalities, for example, that we were just talking about. But I'll go back to Max's comment or question about the non-motorized. Uh, having just had a non-motorized handlebars event, um, I, I'm I'm really concerned about the, the lack of any coordinated program to help people understand that they're really at risk when they're out there, and um, I, I can appreciate the fact that. Collaboration is important, awareness, design roadways, and increase of funding. Well, you know, the $435 million, that's going to go to capital improvements, which aren't going to really affect the people that are showing your little picture here. Uh, they're all getting on scooters and doing all sorts of wild stuff. So, I, you know, I'm wondering if there's a – is there a, a program with some significant funding – that's going to make people more aware of the risk that they pose themselves. I mean, even to the extent of wearing dark clothing uh, in November when they're out, you know, at night. I, I don't get it. 
So, and I'm and I'm concerned because about every week or two, I've, I've got somebody that I know that has had some run-in uh, as a non-motorized person with motorized vehicle, and I I think that's a pretty serious thing. I understand maybe Dr. Cog is not the best form, but we are the regional agency, and we are transportation and trying to get people out of their cars, but we ought to get them out of their cars not to get killed by something else. Well, I, that's a political comment. Jacob, I was... Mr. Rieger? Yeah, so uh, look, we're concerned too, and we, and we appreciate your comment. It's very timely and it's very important. We share that concern. We all share that concern. To answer your question, to attempt to answer your question, multiple agencies, including Dr. Cog, including CDOT, um, RTD, local governments have periodically and consistently worked on the sort of human behavior education campaign side of things. Uh, we ran a campaign a couple years ago called Slow Speeding, which was the idea that just going that little bit over the speed limit, right, um, can actually be really dangerous. Um, CDOT's really good about doing um, multiple sort of education campaigns throughout the course of a year and other agencies. The problem, truthfully, is that human behavior is the hardest thing to change. And in the Vision Zero construct and the safety construct, as we've talked about before, there's, I don't know if it's five E's or six E's or what we're up to, but there's a whole lot of, you know, design, roadway design, speeding, human behavior, education, engineering, enforcement. There's a whole bunch of multi-pronged strategies that we all need to keep doing uh, to try and reverse the kind of trends we're seeing on the screen. So we share your concern. We hear you. We agree. Hard to do. We're still working on it. Thank you. And, and that would be my expectation from an organization like Dr. Cox. Is there money available for awareness? Um, are, are there, I mean, uh, we, we certainly have money for clean air kinds of programs. Mr. Papstorf? Here, thanks. Um, interesting, Rick. There was a moment in the FAST Act when the federal government told that they couldn't each sip money on educational safety um, efforts. And so we went several years where there was a whole chunk of resource, federal resources that went to states that wasn't eligible to be spent on sort of those safety education com uh, efforts. Um, with the IJA, I believe that restriction went away, and so we're back to being able to spend some portion of that, but it takes some time to re-up that. I th you know, there is certainly an educational component, a safety component um, to that. I think we're focused on the resources, the, the bulk of the resources that are available to us to invest in capital improvements, right, um, because we don't have a lot of resources as the MPO to do the things you're talking about, right? We might be able to support some of them, but we're, our, our resources are largely focused on those sort of design pieces. And I would also say that, taking this opportunity, that a lot of the things that we can do to make the roadway safer for all users, make the roadway safer for those vulnerable users, and we're focused on those types of improvements. And, um, you know, I, I'm always, I'm reluctant to jump on to sort of blaming the victim of that crash because they happen to wear dark clothing, for instance. You know, we shouldn't have to dictate to people what they have to wear to be able to be safe on the transportation system, whether they're walking or riding a bike. There are con con common sense things for bike bicyclists to have reflectors and those things when they're riding at night. I mean, those are common sense. We should remind people of that. But we can do things to improve the transportation system so that if someone happens to make a mistake, they aren't at risk for getting killed. That small mistake by a driver of a vehicle results in a pretty minor fender bender, right? That mistake for a pedestrian or a bicyclist can be fatal. And I think we need to, you know, if it's looking at making sure we've got l adequate lighting on the street system at intersections so that people are visible regardless of what color clothing they wear, those are things that we can actively do to improve the system, make it safer for everybody. Thank you. Um, Mr. Hyde-Wright? I have the same misgivings about using the 305 number for 2022 in the calculation as opposed to the 346, but setting aside that for a moment, even if we did only achieve 305 fatalities in 2022, 
the trajectory of the little line that's connected by your brown dots is not going to zero by 2040. And I guess we're on, if we go back two slides to slide nine. Um, so we're significantly over the minus 13 fatalities per year that we need to be on that line. And so if we stick to that same slope for the higher line, we're gonna miss our target by several years. And that's also completely ignoring the fact that over the last two years, we've been increasing our fatalities by 46 per year. And so when we're setting our target, don't we need a steeper slope to get us towards our eventual goal of zero rather than staying on the same slope, which is already wishful thinking? Let me know. Here we go. Um, so I think uh, to partly answer your question, um, I would actually show us the serious injury target. Um, when we set the horizon year of 2040 with the board back in 2020, after our board adopted taking action with Regional Vision Zero, um, we did this straight line trend just to see from where we were then, where do we want to be by 2040, and what was that average reduction? I would say that we recognize that the data points are going to jump around this horizon, this trend line, and so we did not, in this example, from 14, 1,448 serious injuries show that 68 reduction last year because we thought that we weren't sure on the data point. We figured it would start jumping around that blue line that was the trend line. So I would keep that consistency in the methodology we're setting this year. We do recognize 318 is where we are right now. 305 isn't where we want to be, but we do expect to see as more um, capital improvements get done, more educational campaigns get done, um, as make improvement in safety that this green line jumps around the blue line. And so our average yearly reduction is still 13 fatalities from where we were in 2020. Recognizing where we are right now might not be where we were with serious injuries last year. That approach is not based on what we've observed over the last several years. And that would seem to be relying on the assumption that we've only started investing in safety in the last two years. But that approach works if we're bouncing above and below the blue line, but we're bouncing way above and even higher above the blue line. Yes, um, in an effort to not redo the methodology every year to get us to zero by 2040, we did want to show some progress on that. So I think to your point right now, you're correct that 318 is far above what should be the 244. And I think that's a message for us as Dr. Cog, as local member governments, as stakeholders in the region to what do we need to continue to be doing to get us to zero by 2040 or 2045. The blue line set that methodology back in 2020 and we expect to see and want to see the reduction to zero by 2040, but part of the requirements for the federal measures is best available data. So we do want to show a reduction and we're doing that through our horizon year of 2040 that we set back in 2020. Thank you. Mr. Bruno. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren and Alvin. Uh, just a question. Is there a correlation or did you assume a correlation with the target numbers with respect to compliance with Vision Zero throughout the district or the Dr. Cog area in each municipality? Or is there a correlation, I guess is what I'm asking. Um, we did not take into account a correlation when we first reached out to the board back in 2020 to figure out what would be an appropriate horizon year. We did take into account how many jurisdictions at that time had Vision Zero goals. Uh, and so through guidance from them and just discussions, um, we polled what were some realistic horizon years that we as a region could achieve, just recognizing how diverse and varied our various member communities are. And so um, 2040 was where we ended up with the board at that time. So I wouldn't say um, we correlated the targets with that, but we did take into consideration widespread the Vision Zero um, adoption rate was at that time to help figure out what was realistic as a region. Mr. Mormon. Again, thank you for presenting this information. Will this information be used as you do the active transportation plan and the regional transportation plan? The reason I ask is back to what uh, Pilgrim talked about was an education, it seems like that the education should be in the plans um, so that we can point to it that, yeah, we're going to spend some money on education so that we can 
we don't have it in the plan, then it's harder to get funding and grants. But if we can show it in the plan, I think whether it's awareness education or how to directly ride in our bike lanes, whatever, or walk on the walk, you know, those sort of things. That'd be my. Thank you. Um, yeah, we do. Uh, I wouldn't say we use the safety targets uh, to guide those plans specifically, um, like taking action on regional vision zero, which already sets the commitment of zero, is used to inform the regional transportation plan. Um, because these are such federally required and prescribed in terms of the data to use, the rolling average, um, what are the area we're looking at, I would say that we use our long-term aspirational vision goals that come out of the regional transportation action on regional vision zero to set these. But we do uh, look at, at data during the active transportation plan update that we'll be looking at, um, the active modes crash report that just came out that also highlighted some different stories that in, in the targets. Um, Mr. Callison. Thank you, Dr. Staff, on this. Um, uh, in terms of the resource, appreciate, Ron, uh, your reference and sort of grounding uh, that programmatically, uh, the funds are going to the capital side. But at the same time, we've re well recognized, and there's continuing research um, on the human factor side. And the human factors are, are not only affecting correctable, but they're affecting, um, they're drawing attention to behavior. And there's a positive resources to address all the infrastructure out there, much less the new new coming in infrastructure to retrofit and to, and to adjust. Um, that tells me uh, we have speeding and, and bad driving behaviors that are a significant component of serious and fatality outcomes on that. Uh, and, and there's education uh, and then there's other um, more, you know, lower tolerance or zero tolerance sanctions uh, that I think need to be explored and the effectiveness of those need to be assessed and, and put into the program. Comment or responses, curious on that. No disagreement for me. Thank you, Mr. Papstorf. Um, Mr. Pilgrim. Thank you, Madam Chair. Would it be appropriate to add a little bit of a sentence to, to reflect what Mac and Kent and others have been saying uh, to the proposed motion? Or do you, would it be better to introduce the motion and then look for? I defer to Dr. Cog, but I believe that the motion is in regards to the federal performance-based um, requirements, and perhaps a lot of this discussion may be best suited for the update for the regional um, Vision Zero plan effort. Mr. Papstorf. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I, would, I would agree. I think that it's not exactly related to uh, exercise at hand, which is just adopting um, a federal performance measure as required by federal law. I, we've, we've definitely heard this feedback. I think it's important. I would, would agree it's more relevant to our update of our Vision Zero plan, our update of the active transportation plan that will be coming up this year as we embark on updating our 2050 regional plan. And I think as you look at those things and even our existing Vision Zero plan, I think you'll see a lot of that reflected, um, but um, I, I do agree with, with the chair that this is, this is a particular issue, and I think muddying it a little bit in terms of our federal requirement just to adopt a target under a very, very prescribed method, and I think that's the challenge we've always had with this federal performance measure relative to our actual goal of achieving zero serious injuries and, and fatalities on our transportation system is this muddies that water because of the way the federal government prescribes how we have to go through the math to set a target. Okay, thanks. Additional questions or comments for Dr. Cobb? Thank you for the robust discussion. Um, do we, uh, there is a proposed motion available? Mr. Mormon. 
move to recommend the regional trans to the regional transportation committee adopt the 2024 safety targets for the metropolitan planning organization area as part of the federal performance based planning and programming requirements and adopt the horizon years of achieving of achieving uh, zero fatalities by 2024 and zero serious injuries by 2020 2045 thank you mr mormon is there a second is that mr whitaker i'll second thank you mr whitaker any further discussion Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passes you now. Oh, Mr. Hydright. Are you abstaining from the vote? Thank you, Mr. Hydright. Thank you. The motion passes with an abstention from Mr. Hydright. And that concludes the action items for um, the agenda for today. Uh, we will move on to the discussion items. Um, the next item is item number six, corridor planning pilot program update. And this is attachment D in your packet. I'll turn it over to Ms. Nora Kern, uh, manager of sub area and project planning program. All right, um, I promise much much less math required for, for this presentation. Um, so I'm here to present an update to um, you all in our quarter planning pilot program. Um, so just to recap, I've talked about this several times um, with this group, but um, our quarter planning program um, is focused on advancing the priorities and projects that are outlined in the 2050 regional transportation plan. So we started a pilot of this program last year um, and selected projects um, uh, about a year ago today. Um, and it's, uh, you know, the project selection was focused specifically on those corridors that are identified in the regional transportation plan. So the ones that are called out for um, transit improvements, um, bus rapid transit in the future, um, corridor safety improvements, um, and a couple of couple other categories. So um, the pilot started uh, on two corridors, the Alameda Corridor Study and the South Boulder Road Corridor Study. So I'm just gonna, we're about six months through both of those studies, so I wanted to kind of give a brief update on where we are um, and some of the early lessons learned through this pilot program. So the first study I'll touch on is the Alameda Avenue Corridor Study. Um, this study is looking at Alameda Avenue from um, Wadsworth in Lakewood all the way through Denver, past Glendale, and out to the R Line in Aurora. It is identified in the 2030 staging period for a future bus rapid transit corridor. So transit is kind of front of mind as we look at this corridor. We've been working closely with Lakewood, Denver, Aurora, Glendale, CDOT, and RTD. So a lot of different stakeholders um, impacted. And our two consultants, uh, uh, Felsberg, Holden, Ulevig, and Nelson Nygaard are helping us with the study. So um, on this, this corridor, it is 14 miles long. So we have actually decided to break the corridor into six segments. So we're looking both at some overarching goals um, and priorities for the entire corridor, but also looking within each of the segments, which are fairly distinct from east to west to make sure we're also considering kind of what's necessary and what's already happened in each of the five, six segments. So just a, just a brief outline of our schedule. We started this last summer, um, working with many, many of you and many of your colleagues on this project. Um, we've kind of completed our background and current conditions report. So that is drafted, um, lots of great data about how the corridor is operating today, crash, crashes, transit, um, other infrastructure challenges along the corridor. We did complete our first phase of public engagement um, last October through December. We had uh, five different focus groups. We have a website with um, hundreds of comments from the public. We've gotten um, really great support from many of the public information, public information offices for the jurisdictions along the corridor. Um, and now we're focused on developing the vision and goals for the, for the corridor and starting to draft concepts. So getting into the fun stuff. Um, we are planning on wrapping up this study over the summer. So we, we plan another round of engagement to kind of review the draft concepts and then we'll have a final corridor plan um, sometime over the summer. Um, just a couple of the themes um, that kind of have emerged from this study, um, obviously connectivity, 
both along and in north-south across this corridor is a big, big topic. Um, safety, this is a corridor that's on Dr. Cog's high injury network, so looking at reducing serious and fatal crashes and crashes for vulnerable road users is a top priority. Um, improved transit, you know, this corridor, as, as I mentioned, is identified as a future bus rapid transit corridor. So while we don't foresee kind of going all the way through the project development process now, we're, we're trying to set up the corridor so that we can move to look more closely at the transit piece in the coming years with our um, jurisdictional partners. Um, accessibility is very important. There's some sidewalk gaps along this corridor. Lots of the corridor is challenging to navigate. We've heard from folks if you, you are using a mobility device or if you are in a wheelchair. Um, mobility for all users, particularly those kind of walking and biking. And then last, vibrancy. Um, Alameda Corridor is, is home to a lot of really important cultural groups and local businesses and restaurants and neighborhoods um, kind of in the region. So we want to make sure that we're kind of enhancing and preserving the, the culture, cultural character of the corridor um, at, along it as we plan for the future. So next, uh, somewhat similar, we, we're also working at South Boulder Road. Um, you can see all of our um, partners have been working closely with the City of Boulder, the City of Lafayette, City of Louisville, Boulder County, RTD, um, and we have Farron Piers as our primary consultant, but also working with Kimley Horn and Jen. So South Boulder Road is identified in the Regional Transportation Plan for um, uh, tr transit improvements. It's in the 2040 staging period, so a little bit farther out, but um, it's been great to work with all of our project partners to really map out the future of the corridor and think about long-term where South Boulder Road is going and what, what might change and kind of how we can achieve those, those shared goals along this corridor. So it is, um, we did extend it just slightly, so it's running from um, Broadway on the western end in Boulder um, all the way through um, Boulder County, um, Lafayette, Louisville, to 120th on the eastern end. So similar timeline here, we're just a tad behind, but we have wrapped up our background and current conditions. Um, we're in the middle of a community engagement phase, so we'll actually be having our first public meeting about this study on um, Wednesday, so in two days, uh, as well as some, some pop-ups and focus groups later this week. Um, and then similarly, we'll be looking to develop vision and goals, draft um, potential cross-sections, um, we'll be running those through a, a second phase of engagement in the spring and then looking to develop our final um, vision plan uh, over the summer. Um, I will note with both of these, these are kind of a, a little bit of a first step study, so there hasn't really been a regional study looking closely at either of these corridors. We don't intend to take a project from this and if, you know, immediately go into project development, but we're really trying to set the stage so that we can work with um, our, our, mem our partners in the region to kind of take projects out of these um, studies and, and move them forward. So on South Boulder Road, I know Boulder County is already looking at a phase two kind of transit focused study, um, looking really at the transit elements that might come out of this study. So we kind of see a similar process probably in Alameda where there might be some short term immediate improvements we want to work on, but there might also be some longer term projects that come out of this that we'll work on with the region. So um, the reason I kind of wanted to present today was just, you know, with, this is a pilot program for Dr. Cog. We haven't done this type of work at least in the last decade or so. So it's been a learning process for us and we're really grateful for many of you and our other partners who kind of worked with us and, and figured this out as we've gone along. A couple of kind of the key highlights of some of our lessons learned and, and more coming every day as we kind of move into the second phase of these projects. But um, it has been, you know, we've realized, you know, we really do serve that convener role in the region and it works really well sometimes on these corridors that are multi-jurisdictional running through multiple counties and cities we can really help bring people together and make sure we're kind of planning cohesively and not everybody planning in their own um, jurisdictional boundaries um, of course one of the challenges with that is you know it does then involve having to coordinate particularly um, engagement across multiple stakeholders dr cog doesn't have you know we're, we're, we don't have stakeholders per se in terms of members of the public so it really requires us to work in close partnership with the, those jurisdictional partners to make sure we're reaching people and understanding how to reach people. We've been working on some internal processes. These are new for us, so it's been kind of working out some kinks in terms of how we do procurement and um, obviously do project management for these um, types of studies. Um, and then last, I think one of the things we're really thinking about is what comes next. So obviously, we're not going to be building um, transit or sidewalks as Dr. Cog. So we really want to make sure these studies are setting up um, our partners in the region to kind of be able to take projects 
and take them to the next level. So I think that's um, something we're kind of continually learning about and probably will continue to as we wrap these first pilot projects up. The last, just a look ahead, and again, presented most of this um, before, so should be familiar, but uh, after the pilot program, we have now established the corridor planning program as a set aside in the 2024 to 2027 transportation improvement program. So we have $3 million set aside. Um, we've already dedicated um, the first two years of that funding to go towards Sheridan Boulevard safety study and the East Colfax bus rapid transit extension. Um, so we're really excited. We're already working with um, many of you on those two projects um, and pending kind of our IGA and getting all the dots um, dotted and the T's crossed, we'll be able to move forward with those hopefully in the coming months. And then looking ahead, we do anticipate another call for projects in 2025 for the last two years of the set aside. So with that, I'll take any questions if there are any. Thank you for the update, Ms. Kern. Um, any questions or comments for Dr. Cog? Well, thank you for that update. I think we are all speechless. Really appreciate the very thorough update and appreciate Dr. Cog's efforts um, to work on these corridors and work with communities. Thank you. All right, and I think I have the next one, which will be very quick, um, but just kind of wanted to give an update about a new web map we have that's a little bit related to the last topic. I don't know if I need a formal introduction. Sure, <laughs> I'll just mention that this is item number seven in your packet, your regional, uh, Dr. Cog Regional Corridor Planning Web Map Update, Ms. Kern, please proceed. Thank you, Chair. Um, so yeah, this is just a quick update about a, a, a resource that we've been working on at Dr. Cog that we wanna make sure everyone's aware of and hopefully also ask your help in making sure it's maintained. But we have started, um, we have developed about six months ago this current corridor planning studies web map um, the goal is this is a, a map kind of of all the quarter-based planning efforts that we are aware of going on around the region. These are not just our studies, but also studies that uh, member governments are working on, as well as studies that RTD or CDOT or others might be leading. So the purpose of doing this is just trying to help kind of build that coordination, general awareness, whether or not you're a member of a public or a member of government, so we can kind of keep track of what we're all doing and hopefully kind of collaborate. So. You can see the corridor projects are, are um, roughly organized by type, you know, active transportation, transit planning, corridor planning, um, kind of a planning environmental linkages, NEPA and design. Um, so this is kind of a, a ongoing um, project. So if uh, this is in our, on our website now, if you do notice a project that you're working on that's not on here, or you wanna update the status or you know, make sure we have the correct website, we'd love for you to just email me um, we can make sure it gets updated. Um, and similarly, when projects kind of start construction, we'll take them off. This is really focused on that planning stage. So um, as we kind of move towards construction, some of these will um, be archived. Oh. Thank you, Ms. Kern. Any questions or comments for Dr. Cobb? Ms. Hillhouse. So just thank you, Nora, appreciate it. I am seeing some inaccuracies on both like things that are missing than things that are highlighted that aren't in motion, at least in Denver. And so maybe talking to your methodology for how did you grab this data? And then I understand we'll update you just directly. Is that the request? Yeah, we've grabbed a lot from your website, so from and from jurisdictional websites. Um, okay. But it's probably been six months since I kind of did a deep dive, so I'm sure there's some are missing. Um, we'll probably have a regular check-in. So if there is a, a website in your in Denver that we should kind of refer to, that would be helpful to know. Um, or if you just have new projects, you can let us know to make sure they're kind of right. Okay, awesome. We'll reach out and okay, make perfect. sure. Yeah. Mr. Mormon. So are these projects that are underway as opposed to maybe completed, not, not constructed, but the corridor planning is completed? Or, or are you just showing? Yeah. And then, so these are actual current projects as opposed to completed projects? <clears throat> That's a good question. So, you know, it's a little hard to define when a project is complete, uh, specifically, you know, across kind of a, a standardized definition across the whole region. So we have projects that are currently underway or have been underway in the last um, three to five years. 
if, if it was more than five years ago, we want to kind of take them off because they're probably not relevant. But if it's a project that wrapped up in the last year, somebody might be interested in kind of knowing what happened and where that, that project landed, we wanted to leave it up here. So they're removed if they're more than five years old or if they've started the construction phase, at which point they're no longer planning, they're now um, construction. Thank you, just so that as we update you, we're not sending you things that you say, no, that's not what we've been taking. Thank you. Yep. And if there is a planning study that is four years old, but you really don't feel like it's relevant anymore, you can also let us know. We, we're not trying to be super strict, but we just wanted to have a, a cutoff where we're not going to show them anymore. Mr. Rieger? Yeah, thanks, um, Madam Chair. Just to supplement that a little bit and to tag on to what Nora said, one way to think about this project is that if you wanted to see the fiscally constrained investment priorities in our long-range plan, we have an interactive web map, right? You could go look at our long-range plan and understand what the region's priorities are. If you wanted to understand what we were funding through our transportation improvement program, you could use our TRIPS database and do something similar, and you could see what's in our TIP. This is about everything in between. If we know something's in the plan, if we know that something's happening, not a TIP project yet, but we know that there's work on it. That's what we're trying to capture, both for our stakeholders, even for the public. You know, I know that federal is important or Colfax is important. What's the status? What's going on with this roadway near my house? This is the idea that you can go and look at that map and understand if there is a current or recent PEL study, NEPA study, some kind of corridor study along those corridors, what's happening between sort of that gap between when it's in the long range plan and when it moves to a TIP project. So that's really what this is about. Ms. Micklebest. Yeah, thanks for the work on this tool. It looks fantastic. I'm curious how you differentiate um, projects that are multiple things. They are transit planning and they're under in NEPA and they're also in design. So how do you pick which color is appropriate? For example, Federal Boulevard is transit planning with it is in NEPA and design. That's a great question. <laughs> there's not really a one answer. You know, we on federal, there's actually three projects currently listed. We have the multimodal, you know, corridor study. Um, a couple years ago, there's the Denver Moves Federal Study and the Federal Boulevard BRT. And so it's definitely not a, it's a more of an art than a science. Um, we tried to go based on what category we felt like was the best fit of that, that phase of the study. But some of them bleed into each other, like Federal is a great example. It's kind of been a bunch of studies stacked on top of each other that's now turned into a NEPA project. So we're very open to um, the Federal Boulevard BRT, for example, we put in NEPA because it is kind of entering that official phase, um, whereas the earlier ones were transit planning and quarter planning. So um, it's, again, trying to kind of come up with categories that can group all the really different study, study types of studies that we have across the region. It's not a perfect uh, methodology, and so we're definitely open to, to adjusting, but we tried to do the best bucket that it seemed to fit. And a little bit, I will note the, the categories are a little bit chronological, so we did want to capture as projects really start to pick up speed and enter the official kind of environmental review stages, we wanted to make sure we were capturing that, and so those projects, those categories in particular, we wanted to make sure reflected so people were aware elevated. Ms. Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair, and Nora, thank you for this excellent resource. Um, detailed question, I noticed that there's some um, nodes on here, and we're looking at quarter planning studies. I noticed some dots, some, um, some red dots. Are you also looking for intersection projects or just? Um, great question. Yeah, it was mostly the interchanges, so or where there's a major like intersect, like crossing. Um, you know, there's a lot, I know there's, if we tried to capture every intersection project in the entire region, it would be impossible. So we mostly kept it to the interstate interchanges, which are all these red dots. Um, I think this one green dot was a little dry creek trail grade separation project. That one, you know, honestly, we maybe could take off. It was kind of on the border. I think it was TIP funded, which is why it kind of ended up on this list. We did kind of comb through the TIP to think of projects that might fit. So, um, I would say unless it's like a really high level intersection like this one where it's kind of a grade crossing of, of a corridor, which kind of makes it a corridor project, we can reflect those. Same with the, obviously the interchanges are, you know, location based on a corridor, but not a whole corridor. So we included those 
But if there's others that you think would be good to include, we'd be happy to, to add those. Again, it's a gray area, so. Any additional questions or comments? Well, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kern, for this update. And if you have any updates on this web map, please do reach out to Ms. Kern for that. Uh, the next agenda item is item number eight in your packet. This is the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan 2024 Mitigation Action Plan Annual Report. And this is attachment F in your packet, and I'll hand it over to Jacob Rieker, Multimodal Transportation Planning Manager. Great. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, for some of you, this will be a refresher, and for some of you, this will be brand new. But we wanted to talk about uh, some of the implementation work that we're doing around a particular aspect of our 2050 Regional Transportation Plan related to um, the state's greenhouse gas transportation planning. So a little bit of review here. Uh, most of you were with us. Many of you were with us um, back in 2022. And um, so we had originally adopted the 2050 RTP actually back in April of 21. Um, and then at the end of that year, um, the, the State Transportation Commission adopted what's known as the Transportation Greenhouse Gas Planning Standard, let's just call it the Greenhouse Gas Rule, um, and that required a major update actually to our plan that we did again um, over the course of 2022 to comply with the requirements of that rule. And in the course of updating our plan to comply with the rule, there were um, numerous strategies that you see on the screen that we had to deploy um, and work through in order to achieve compliance. So uh, I, I love silly analogies. My analogy here is a layer cake of strategies that we use to do this work. What we're gonna talk about today is actually the bottom, um, it's yellow, but it kind of looks green to you, um, kind of that very bottom slice of the layer cake, mitigation measures and mitigation action plan. So first, just a little bit more math on Monday afternoon, because we haven't had enough math today. Um, per the rule, we actually have greenhouse gas reduction targets, and these are in million metric tons, and these are for our MPO planning area, um, so our you know, sort of urbanized area um, in this region, our, our MPO urbanized area. Um, and these are by analysis year, so these are targets, reduction levels set by analysis year, 2025, 2030, 2040, 2050, for the Dr. Cog MPO area. Um, CDOT also has this same requirement um, as over the time do the other MPOs in the state for their MPO areas and CDOT for the non-urban areas of the state. So the idea is that we need to show through our regional transportation plan that we can meet these greenhouse gas reduction levels for our area by analysis here. Um, so basically this chart, again, in million metric tons is just showing kind of the steps that we went through, the baseline of our plan as originally adopted, some of the strategies that we deployed to help get us there, and then showing our mitigation action plan, which is what I'm gonna talk about today, which provides that last little sliver um, to get us over the top, so to speak, so that we can meet the reduction levels, which we do meet by comparing the fourth row in bold black uh, with the bold red in the fifth row, which are the reduction levels specified in the rule, so that we can show that yes, by analysis here, we met the greenhouse gas reduction level targets. So how did we do that in the, in, the con, in the construct of the mitigation action plan? Again, it's needed as a last step to close that remaining reduction level gap. When we've done everything else that we did in the plan with our model, with our technical analysis, with our projects, with our off-model analysis, everything that we've done, and we just needed to close that remaining gap, that's what a mitigation action plan is for. The mitigation action plan under the rule documents our region's approach to using mitigation measures, which I'll show you in a moment, um, in the mitigation action plan to help us do that. And it reports and analyzes measures at the regional level. So this is, again, a regional sort of analysis as part of the mitigation action plan. However, we anticipate that implementation will be um, associated with a small fraction of the region in strategic or applicable geographies. And you'll see that when we talk about the measures. So we report on it regionally, but these measures might be very localized in terms of how, how they're applied or how they're implemented. And per the rule, we do have ample opportunity to implement successfully over time to help us achieve compliance because we don't need a mitigation action plan until the 2030 analysis year. 
So again, coming back here for just a moment, you'll see in the chart that for 2025, we comply with the reduction levels without the need for mitigation measures or a mitigation action plan. But it's starting in 2030, where yes, we do need that little sliver um, that's afforded to us through the mitigation action plan in order to start achieving compliance with the uh, reduction levels. Okay, so in terms of the mitigation measures themselves, because of the way we structured our compliance and because of the tools available to us, we were able to do a lot of things either directly through our plan, through our modeling associated with the plan, through our focus model, um, through some off-model kind of analysis, technical analysis and things that we were able to do. So when we did all of those things in the layer cake and we were kind of left with that little bit of a gap to close, what kind of remained for us was that the mitigation measures that we put together were policy-based and they weren't project-based, right? Because we'd already covered the project-based stuff. We'd already covered the technical stuff through some of those other techniques, through our model, through our plan. So we were really looking at policy-based mitigation measures to form our mitigation action plan. Again, as I said, these are measured regionally, um, but implemented locally. Mitigation measures, I want to be very clear about this, are voluntary for those who would take the lead, meaning our local governments primarily in implementing them. That is a voluntary exercise, and they're not required to implement in any specific location or at any specific time. The requirement is that Dr. Cog as the MPO needs to report on the region's progress implementing the mitigation action plan, but we do that through cooperative collaboration with our local governments who for them it's voluntary to undertake any particular mitigation measure. Again, we can adjust these over time based on the implementation status as we work towards 2030. If we find that, well, this particular measure maybe isn't as practical or as useful as we thought it would be, or this other measure actually you know, is getting implemented more quickly or at a higher level than we thought it would be, we can make those adjustments in our mitigation action plan. That said, we do have a requirement in the greenhouse gas rule that annual reporting on implementation progress is required each year. Um, by April 1st, we transmit that to the State Transportation Commission by April 1st of each year. So we did our first report last year, that's on our website, um, and we're working on this year's report um, for, the, for the mitigation. So let me actually show you the mitigation measures. Um, again, a little bit more math here. Up until this point, everything I've shown you has been in million metric tons. That's the requirement of the rule. In the mitigation measures, again, because we're closing that small remaining gap, we're looking at small things that add up over time to have value. So these numbers are in actual metric tons. This is the only time you'll see something that's in actual metric tons, not million metric tons. The point of these measures, as you see, increasing residential density, job density, mixed-use transit-oriented development, reduce or eliminate minimum parking requirements, adopting local complete street standards. Again, these are local government-led. These are policy-oriented. These are things you all would do and have been doing in your jurisdictions over time. So this is about actions that local governments would take in these categories. And for each mitigation measure um, that's in our mitigation action plan that I just showed you, this is what's required in the greenhouse gas rule that we have to report on each year. So I'm not going to go through all of these. You can read them. But the point is that we have to show kind of what's happening with these mitigation measures. Are they starting to be implemented? Have they been implemented? Obviously, we're not there yet. We're just starting on this journey. Um, but we need, sort of need to catalog the status of each of these implementation, each of these mitigation measures in terms of if or how or at what level they're being implemented. If there's changes, we need to document those. Um, if, you know, delayed, canceled, substituted, we need to talk about that. Um, and then we also need to talk about for measures that are located in a disproportionately impacted community, if there's changes to those, we need to kind of explain that a little bit as well. So these are all requirements from the greenhouse gas rule that we have to include in our annual reporting on mitigation measures. So as we've started to kind of size this up both last year and this year, um, a lot of questions for us here, right? Um, and sort of hinted at that in what we've talked about so far. How do we do this stuff, right? How do we track this? Um, you know, it could be potentially very data, staff, financial, or otherwise resource intensive, right? This is not meant to be an accounting. We're not gonna go to our 56 local governments every single time that you all make a zoning change or a land use change and say, hey, what'd you do last month in your planning and zoning commission? Does that count towards the rule? Um, is, you know, is it, was it big enough, important enough, germane enough that we could count it? 
you know, we're, that sort of bean counting is a very sort of difficult exercise. But in cooperation with you, we do need to try and at least have a general understanding of what local governments are doing in these, in these arenas and in these categories. Um, how do we define measurement baseline and changes over time? Um, these are policy changes, right? So according to the rule and to CDOT's implementing what's known as a um, policy directive, policy directive 1610, it's not about what's actually happening on the ground, actually. It's about an action that a local government takes in terms of a land use change or a rezoning, not the development that may have resulted from that change. Let me say that again. So policy changes, rezoning, not the actual development activity that occurs from that rezoning or from that land use change. Well, guess what? That's actually pretty hard to track. That's actually pretty hard to deal with over time. And so part of our exercise has been to think about both how we can do this, but to be quite frank, maybe what needs to change in the policy directive to make this easier for agencies like Dr. Cog, who have to report on this stuff, to be able to do so in a meaningful way to relate it back to greenhouse gas emissions. The other big component of this, of course, is local government outreach and support. Because these types of measures, as I've already said multiple times, are led primarily by local governments, we want to work with you. We want to know what you're doing. We want to provide support and information to you. I will actually shine the spotlight on our chair. The city and county of Broomfield last year updated their parking standards. They actually came to us, which Sarah, I really appreciated, and said, look, we are updating our parking standards. We actually reviewed that in the context of the greenhouse gas rule, in the context of our mitigation measure around reducing or eliminating um, parking minimums, um, and did that exercise for the city and county of Broomfield. So that's the kind of stuff that we want to do. We want to help you all, and we want to think about the implications of when you take actions like this, how does it fit within the construct of the rule? Um, and I guess let me make this, this bottom bullet point, too, because it's important. Really easy to get super technical, again, sort of the accounting mechanism or the sort of, you know, um, kind of bean counting. I don't want to minimize it that way, but just, you know, we can get in the weeds really quickly. What I want to be clear is that ultimately what we're trying to do here is leverage data and processes for multiple efforts and good planning. We specifically chose these mitigation measures because they weren't new to this region. These are things that you all and we all have been doing for a number of years around fast tracks and transit-oriented development, um, around mixed use and rezonings and those sorts of things. But we wanted to build on the foundation that we've collectively established in this region and continue that for this work. So specifically for the 2024 report, there's some areas that we are focusing on. Knowing last year when we were starting to put together our now adopted 24-25 Unified Planning Work Program, which is our Metropolitan Planning Organization Work Program, our two-year program for the work that we do together in our MPO function, we actually included language around implementing mitigation measures around working with local governments and collaborating with you all um, on these mitigation measures. So we want to reflect that language in that work in this year's report. Um, a lot of us on staff at Dr. Cog in various contexts have had a lot of outreach um, to you all as local governments. So we want to capture those conversations and what we're learning from you all and what you all are doing um, in terms of, you know, potential applicability to the mitigation action plan. Um, we've done a lot of work as we presented on in our Dr. Cog Equity Index. Um, and so we want to reflect kind of that work and the disproportionately impacted communities aspect of mitigation measures within the report. And then finally, as, as most of us know, um, we're at the beginning of the legislative session, but we all anticipate that this legislative session will deal with some of these issues around housing, around transit-oriented development, around some of those priorities and vision that have been laid out by our governor that really, frankly, impact several of the mitigation action measures that we have in our plan. So moving target to be determined, won't even know by April 1st, won't affect what we're doing for this year's report, but knowing that actions that are taken this year potentially by the General Assembly could influence future years' work on these mitigation measures. So that's your drink from a fire hydrant, but we just wanted to show you kind of the context for this, reorient you to this work. Happy to take any questions or input um, as we're putting this uh, mitigation action plan report together. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rieger, for a concise but thorough uh, presentation on a pretty complex topic. Um, any questions or comments for Dr. Cog's staff? Uh, Mr. Hedright. Jacob, um, I have a couple of quick questions. 
In conversations with local governments, do you think that there are enough of the changes in the pipeline between now and 2030 to get us to the 0.1 million metric ton reduction that's called for in the mitigation plan? Yeah, I'm going to be honest. We don't know. That's that's too hard to tell at this point because we're talking about something that's, what, six years away now? So, yeah, to, to be determined. I think, you know, local governments are doing a lot of these things. But, again, we're going per the prescription of the rule, and the question is, are they doing enough of it at a level that counts for the rule? And that's what we're starting to try and figure out together um, and assess that over time. Again, with the knowledge that if we start getting into this in another two or three years and we find that, you know what, we're starting not to be on track or we're on track with this measure but not this measure, we can course correct. At the same time, we'll also be um, doing a major update, starting a major update to our 2050 regional transportation plan about the middle of this year. So we will be updating our mitigation action plan as part of that work. So that's another opportunity where we can kind of assess, you know, where are we at, how is it going, and do we need to make changes over time? Kind of hinted at my follow-up question, but let's say that we get into 2027, 2028, and we're still not on track given that the mitigation measure action items are voluntary for each individual jurisdiction what does the plan to course correct look like yeah i mean again that's a hypothetical that's several years away that's hard to say well we do a b and c i mean i don't think we know yet um how much would we be off track which measures are working which ones aren't working what other tools in the toolbox would be available to to us by then what might the legislature do this year let's say or next year that would change that environment or maybe make some of required you know so there's so many unknowns I, I don't want to get too much into hypotheticals but in concept if we get closer to 2030 and we find that we're not you know we're not on the current track to get there we either need to change our mitigation measures or we need to change something else in the plan because remember it's not just the mitigation measures we can change other aspects of the plan things in the plan to help us get there so we would need to make that that course correction thank you Mr. Begley. Thanks, Jacob. Um, just a question about the local government engagement. Um, I know sometimes Dr. Cog will reach out with like a, a few folks, set up a meeting, we have a conversation. This given the complexity of where a lot of this information resides and how deep we may need to go uh, to pull it for you. Has there been any initial discussion on how, is there, do you think there's any structure around this local government engagement that might go beyond uh, just a handful of meetings um, working through bodies like this or something like that? Uh, it's a really good question, and that's part of what's in our unified planning work program is to kind of work on that framework and that structure. Because, again, because there's so many things that could happen very frequently, you know, we could almost meet with you all like monthly or quarterly to get these kind of updates, and that's not sustainable for you or for us. But, you know, we do need to find a way collaboratively to kind of work with you to understand what you're doing, encourage you. That's partly why I make presentations like this to all of you local government folks. It is just that reminder, let me come back, you know, to these mitigation measures that as you work in this space, we do want to know about it. Even if you're not sure if it's directly applicable to the rule or does it comply or is it enough, you know, that's partly our job, but if you're doing these things, we want to know about it. We want to work with you to know what you're doing and to support you and help you. I mean, that's part of it, too, uh, particularly for the smaller local governments. If you want to do some of these things, but you need some resources or some help, um, that's part of our charge on this as well. Additional questions or comments? Uh, Ms. Hansen. Thank you for this information. I mean, so complex, and so I applaud you for, for tackling it and sharing where you are in the process. Um, you might have already spoken to this, and if did, I apologize, but what is your time frame for um, continuing to develop the methodology for the 2024 reporting, and are you going to be coming back to us with that? Um, yeah, I didn't directly answer that, so that's a good question. So let me, let me try and address that because I heard a couple questions in there. So we, so we adopted the revised 2050 RTP in September of 22, and that was to meet the requirement of the rule that we had to do it by October 1st of 2022. That was, that was spelled out in the rule. And then the rule required the first mitigation action plan report by April 1st of 2023. Literally, we had six months to start getting our arms around this. So last year's report, which, is, as I said, is on our website, was really about you know, trying to size this up, trying to start building a framework, trying to get our arms around this. Obviously, we're not going to report on the status of measures 
where we've had six months to just even start start this process, right? So I would say for this year's report, we're still mostly in that framework kind of perspective as we have started to have interactions with local governments, as we started to learn about some things like the Broomfield example, we are starting to weave some of that directly in as we become aware of it. And we know that you all are doing some things, but for this year's report in particular, I think we're still a little bit in that framework mode of kind of set up. How do we track this? How do we um, think about this over time? That's helpful, thank you. Um, you know, and to Justin's point, the, the more this is standardized as you start to think about that framework um, and we can provide those inputs as the TAC and, and the individual directors, I think it's easier it'll be for, for all of us as the, the local and Dr. Carr. So thank you for doing that. Well, thank you, Jacob, and um, thanks for mentioning City and County of Broomfield, and really appreciate the support for Dr. Cog's staff um, when we are looking at um, revising our parking ordinance, and do encourage any other local agencies that are looking for any mitigation measures around policy, around any of these areas shown up here on the screen, really encourage you to reach out to Dr. Cog and let them know what you're working on, and if you're looking for help, um, they're a fantastic resource. So thank you to Dr. Cog's staff with, with their technical assistance. Thank you for that, Madam Chair. Any additional questions or comments? Seeing none, um, I think we'll move on to the final discussion item on the agenda. Thank you, Mr. Rieger, for that presentation. The, uh, we will move on to the item number nine, Advanced Mobility Partnership Annual Update. This is attachment G in your packet. Kaylee Fallon, Emerging Mobility and Transportation Demand Management Planner, will present this topic. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Kaylee Fallon. I am the Emerging Mobility and Transportation Demand Management Planner here at Dr. Cog. I'm here to give an annual update and overview of the Advanced Mobility Partnership and what we um, have been up to. Um, so just to level set, um, and kind of backtrack, it might be um, a refresher for some folks, but what is the Advanced Mobility Partnership? Um, the partnership is um, was established in 2019 for partner agencies and transportation stakeholders in the region to really coordinate, collaborate, um, and proactively plan for innovative um, and emerging transport transportation technology um, in support of the mobility choice blueprint. So um, there's, there's kind of two groups or, or two levels of the Advanced Mobility Partnership. There is the executive committee, which meets quarterly. Um, those are the, um, that's made up of leadership from the partnership. So that's leadership from Dr. Cog, RTD, CDOT, and the Denver Metro Chamber. Um, and then there is the working group, which previously met monthly, um, although that is going to change in 2024. Um, and those are folks that are um, mostly made up of local member government staffers, planners, engineers. Um, it's really open to anyone who is interested in the topics of emerging mobility um, and really functions as a forum for that information sharing. So a little bit more about Mobility Choice Blueprint, and this is, um, again, the, the plan or the blueprint that the Advanced Mobility Partnership supports. Um, this Mobility Choice Blueprint was developed um, by the partnership through several different um, workshops and stakeholder engagement. Um, again, those partners are RTD, CDOT, Dr. Cog, and the Denver Metro Chamber. Um, and throughout that process, um, the blueprint established seven objectives, and then within those objectives are 30, a total of 34 tactical actions. So um, these objectives are kind of the high-level umbrella categories, um, and then within each of those categories, there are several different tactical actions. Um, these are actionable items that each of the partners um, can take in order to kind of support the vision that Mobility Choice Blueprint laid out. So really looking at regional collaboration, system optimization, shared mobility, data sharing, mobility electrification, driverless vehicle preparation, and new transportation funding. So again, really looking at how can we as a region proactively plan for all the new and innovative transportation technology um, that is coming out. 
this kind of just um, describes the pipeline and the relationship between Mobility Choice Blueprint um, and the Advanced Mobility Partnership. So Mobility Choice Blueprint came first. It was that collaborative, integrative, and regional approach. It established that vision for that proactive planning. Um, and then out of that came the Advanced Mobility Partnership. So um, this is really that forum that exists for that coordination, collaboration, and advancing um, those tactical actions laid out in the blueprint. So this is a high-level overview of what we have discussed um, in, in last year's working group. So um, really want to point out here that I think we've had a great mix of um, not only local, regional, and state presentations, but also out-of-state presentations as well. So um, we think it's really important to not only learn um, from peers throughout Colorado, but also peers um, throughout the nation when it comes to emerging technology, um, because that technology is, is changing, changing so rapidly, and there's um, lots of challenges, but also lots of opportunities and lessons learned. So um, a couple of topics that I'll just highlight really quickly. Um, of course, see that statewide electrification. Um, we had a lot of conversations around funding and grant opportunities, so um, that included CDOT's Innovative Mobility Grants, also Dr. Cog's Innovative Mobility Set-Aside, um, Colorado Energy Office's Community Accelerated Mobility Project grant opportunities, as well as the Regional Transportation Operations and Technology Set-Aside, so Dr. Cog's RTO and T um, Set-Aside Project, so wanting to make sure that folks in the working group are aware of these funding opportunities and these um, grant opportunities. We also had um, a really great universal basic mobility program from our peers over in California, um, so it was great to learn from them. And then, of course, um, focusing on shared mobility, including shared micromobility, those e-scooters, e-bikes, and microtransit. Um, so these are some exciting highlights, just three um, highlights of last year. Um, as we returned to in-person meetings, we had an in-person on-site visit at the Denver International Airport in May. Um, you'll see a picture of Dr. Cog's staffers on the um, runway of the airport, so it was really great. Um, we kind of got a behind-the-scenes tour at the airport and then got to um, learn about the airport's plans um, in relation to emerging technology and, and also transportation demand management. Um, as we know, as the airport is rapidly expanding and um, the third busiest airport in the world. So um, that was really great to kind of learn and, and get to see that um, behind the scenes in person. We also had um, an all about e-bikes panel in June. Um, and that was an in-person meeting. It actually was hybrid. Um, we combined that with our Dr. Cog micromobility group. Um, we had some out of state speakers speak to their e-bike um, libraries. And then we also had local speakers speak to their own um, e-bike e rebates and libraries. Um, so that was great. And then um, kind of as I touched on, that universal basic mobility panel that we had in December, um, that was a virtual meeting, but we had all out-of-state speakers. So again, it was really great to learn um, from our peers and kind of what they're doing in um, the, the mobility as a service space. I just want to um, take a moment to, to highlight the, um, the relationship between the Advanced Mobility Partnership and you all, the Transportation Advisory Committee. Um, so the Transportation Advisory Committee has a liaison um, who serves on the Advanced Mobility Partnership Working Group. So just want to take a moment to thank Carson for all of his work and for serving as that liaison. Really appreciate it. And um, just as an update, Carson has expressed interest in continuing to serve that role as the um, Advanced Mobility Partnership Liaison. So looking ahead to this year, um, the partnership or the working group, excuse me, has um, changed the meeting cadence. So previously in 2023, we met monthly. This year we will be, reading, we will be meeting every other month um, and really just trying to um, reconfigure those working group meetings around um, a specific topic and then having um, discussion prompts after those presentations as to how we as a region can um, move that certain technology or that certain um, data sharing or that certain funding opportunity forward. So um, really looking at mobility as a service, um, curb management, automated and connected vehicles, um, as well as updates on just innovative projects happening throughout the region. So with that, um, that concludes the pres my presentation. If you are, of course, interested in participating or learning more, please feel free to reach out to me. My contact information is on. 
you, Ms. Fallon. Thank you for that update. Um, any questions or comments from the TAC? Uh, Mr. Papstar. Thank you. Um, just to circle back to, I think, the second to last slide. Yeah, I just wanted to confirm with the group that we don't, we don't ask for a formal recommendation or appointment from a TAC, just kind of an informal liaison to the AMP working group. So just want to make sure we have sufficient head nods around the table that we're good with Carson continuing that role as your liaison to the working group. <laughs> we, have, we have some uh, head nods, thumbs up for Mr. Priest to continue in his role. All right, and seeing head nods and thumbs up, thank you, Mr. Priest, for um, serving in this role and continuing to serve in the, as a liaison for the Dr. Koptak. Appreciate it. Any additional questions or comments for Dr. Cox staff? or uh, Mr. Priest as he's in his role. Uh, <laughs> uh, Mr. Hagwright, thank you. I had uh, one quick question. I was wondering if this group is gonna be involved in the regional traffic uh, transit signal priority effort that RTD and Dr. Cog have just started up. Yeah, that's a great question. And um, I, I know that we've had um, interest from the group to be involved in that. So um, I, I think we'll just have the RT, ONT specific working group come and give presentations and kind of do, again, that information sharing um, to the Advanced Mobility Partnership. Any additional questions or comments for Dr. Cobb? Okay, great, thank you for the update, Ms. Fallon, appreciate it. Thank you. And um, that concludes the discussion items of the agenda. Um, the final items are administrative items um, related to member comments or other matters. Um, I think Mr. Rieger, you had um, some points you wanted to bring up. I do, but I wanna give a chance for um, our members if they have any comments first. Any additional comments um, or anything that any member would like to bring forward to the TAC? Seeing none, please proceed, Mr. Rieger. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I have um, three things. Um, first is, um, per our practice, whenever there is a notice of funding opportunity under the bipartisan infrastructure law for a discretionary grant, we send out a form, which we have recently done for the RAISE grant. Um, those forms are due back to us on February 15th. Did I get that right, Cam? All right, February 15th, and that will be an item on our agenda for our February um, TAC meeting. And then speaking of our TAC meetings, I wanna give a look ahead to a couple of meetings coming up that we will need to reschedule. Um, our April TAC meeting is currently on April 22nd um, because of our public comment period and our public hearing. Uh, process for our cycle amendments for our 2050 regional transportation plan. We are going to need to reschedule that meeting and we're looking at um, likely April 29th. We are fortunate that April has five Mondays. Um, so again, we're looking to move the April TAC meeting from the 22nd to the 29th. And then for our May meeting, which is on the fourth Monday, May 27th, that turns out to be Memorial Day, not a good day to have a TAC meeting. So again, there we are looking at moving it up to the third Monday, uh, which would be the 20th. So we'll formalize that, but wanted to give you a heads up on uh, both of those uh, while they're still a couple months away. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Rieger. Any additional questions or comments um, the TAC would like to bring forward? Great. Um, so please do turn in those raise forms if your organization is looking to um, apply to the raise grant and uh, we'll look for those updates on our schedule for April and May. Um, the next meeting is February 26, 2024. If you did not sign in, please check in at uh, the sign in table or with Dr. Cog's staff to be sure you're registered as attending. Thank you for participating today. And the next TAC meeting again is February 26th. And we will now conclude the meeting at 3.04 p.m. Thank you.